I need it. <laughs> I need it. I need it. Praise the Lord. Um, Brother Hulsman, he, he preached so good last week that Brother Whitaker said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to go on a vacation. And we're going to let Brother Hulsman come back, teach and preach. So we're going to get a double dose of him. No, <laughs> that ain't how it went. But Brother Hulsman's back this morning. He preached an incredible word last week. And I'm looking forward to the message God's going to work through him today. Um, and if we could, before he comes up here, as a church, as a body, let's pray. Let's lift our hands and our hearts. We not only want to get our minds right, but we want God to visit this house today. God, we come before you this morning, Lord, because you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, there is none above you, beside you, or beyond you today. We're asking, God, that you would inhabit not only the praise of your people, but, God, the gut-wrenching, heartfelt, God, prayers of your people today, God. Those that have come into the house that are desperate for a word. Those, God, that have come into the house today, Lord, that are struggling. God, that don't know where they're going to get their next glimpse of hope. I'm asking you this morning, Lord, to touch every mind. God, to consume every heart. And God, when we leave this house today, Lord, that we would be able to say beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Almighty God not only visited, but Lord, that you left a piece of yourself in each and every individual in this house today anoint brother Hulsman to teach us today God your word help him to be a conduit in the name of Jesus God help our ears to hear our hearts to receive and we do it all in the name of Jesus the name that we love even above life itself we magnify you Lord and we lift you up Jesus can somebody worship his name can somebody clap their hands to him? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Praise the name of Jesus. Brother Hulsman, come give us what God has given you, brother. Isn't God good? Hallelujah. Well, you can be seated if you want to this morning. I don't want to be take too much time up this morning because I know we transition at 10.15, and so I want to be able to get through everything that I feel the Lord speaking this morning to us. And so I give honor to you for being here this morning. Uh, faithfulness goes a long way with God. God loves faithfulness. And God loves people that are faithful because God's faithful. And because God's faithful, God expects His people to be faithful. And so, it's like the old saying, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. But with God, is if you're faithful, I'm faithful. And so, even when we're not faithful, God's still faithful. Amen. I want to uh, jump right into the Word this morning, but I want to honor your pastor I know God is, is giving them a time of, uh, of being away and being fed at Awakenings in Columbus. Uh, but let's go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. There's a... You can stand if you want, yes. There's a place in time right now that God is, God is speaking very clearly to His church. Um, I know I'm a relatively young man, but I, I believe it's he's speaking in a way that he's never spoke before. Um, he's speaking very clearly. Um, in Revelation, John writes many times that the Lord says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to the body, to the bride. And that is what we are experiencing in this moment in time. And if we are listening, God is speaking all the time. Sometimes we think that God is only speaking once in a while, um, that, that God likes to be quiet. But really, in all sincerity, God is speaking all the time. As my little girl, she's 18 months, almost 19 months, she can't really formulate her words but when she talks, she doesn't stop talking. And that's kind of how God is. God doesn't stop talking. God's always talking. We've just got to listen to what God is saying. And so, 
I feel like what God has given, given me this morning for us is going to help us. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul writes that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And so I just want to talk to us this morning about that I may know him. Amen. Lord, I pray that you guide every word that I say this morning, God. God, that our ears hear what you want to say in this moment. Lord, let us not miss this moment. Let us not pass over this moment. But Lord, let us embrace it that we may hear exactly what you're saying to us, God. God, direct us, help us to prepare our minds and our hearts. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. It's here that the Apostle Paul, he says, and he instructs that we would know Christ. Paul's choice words are not informational knowing But his context of knowing is the same as when a husband and wife know each other through intimacy. That's what Paul was saying when he said that I may know Christ. He was talking in an intimate manner that I've got to really know Christ. Paul's declaration of knowing Him is a declaration of divine importance to the church in this hour. Our calling as Christians is to know Him in every aspect of His identity. Knowing Him is more than just knowing Him through a surface relationship. Because there's a lot of people in this world that says, yes, I know Christ, but really it's a surface relationship. There's a lot of people in the church that just know Him through a surface relationship. Knowing Him is more than just our daily devotions that we do of study of the Word, praying, fasting, worship. It's deeper than all of those things combined. It's deeper than even our faithfulness to the house of the Lord. Knowing Him as the church our focus before we can be effective in whether it's ministry or even in the kingdom of God must be that I may know Him. It's here in Philippians that the Apostle says there are two ways in which we imitate Christ. The first is through the power of His resurrection. And that's the one thing we like to focus on. We always like to talk about the power of His resurrection because we understand what that means. We understand because of that He resurrected, we too can resurrect to a newness of life. And in the power of that resurrection, being filled with His Spirit and baptized in His name through which we have His power. We like to talk about that particular aspect of Philippians chapter 3. But Paul also says a second point. He says, not only do I want to know Him through the power of His resurrection, but I also have to know Him through the fellowship of its sufferings. Death. Our humanity, death has always been something that we would rather do without. We would rather choose life over death because death destroys every aspect of of our humanity. And at times we would rather hold on to that humanity. Sometimes we want to hold that humanity so close because we want to act out in the flesh when flesh does something to us. See, unfortunately though, there is no life unless there is first death. Jesus said, he that does not carry his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So in other words, Jesus was saying it like this. He that does not die is not worthy to be called my child and is not worthy to be used by me. See, when you begin to think about the cross of Christ, it was a tool of suffering and shame that was used 
for an individual. It is possible for an individual when they would hang them on a cross to hang on that cross from anywhere from six hours to four days depending on a lot of different factors that involved that individual hanging on the cross. When you begin to think about the different aspects of the suffering of Jesus, they went beyond just the physical. We can talk about the physical, the crown of thorns, the spear in the side, the cat of nine tails, the, the, the scourgings, the slappings, the plucking of the beard. We can talk about the physical aspects and the physical is sometimes easy because it's the most visible. Really, when you go deeper into the suffering of Jesus, He was betrayed by His brothers. He was humiliated in front of His family, friends, peers, and even religious leaders. He was falsely accused, lied about, suffered at the hands of unjust men, accused of being demon-possessed, accused of not being qualified to be a Religious leader. Isn't this the son of a carpenter? Someone that is not qualified enough. Constantly attacked by a religious system that was more political than spiritual. See, we could go on and talk about the different aspects of the suffering of Christ. But if we are truly going to be like Him and formed into His image... We are going to experience the same types of suffering that Jesus endured. No, we'll never hang on the cross that we can imagine. Don't believe so. But we will endure. Paul writes to us, endure hardness as a good soldier, he says. If we are going to be formed into His image, we must first Learn to take on His identical characteristics. In 1987, a social psychologist by the name of Robert Zajac proposed that convergence in the physical appearance of spouses would be attributed to the fact that lifelong partners became so in sync with one another That they end up unconsciously imitating each other's expressions. Which in time changes the appearance of their faces. The study concluded that those who had been married for 25 years began to physically resemble one another as a result of their prolonged relationship. Now... Guys, if you're ugly and your wife is beautiful, you have a chance. I will just leave it at that. Some of you were laughing when I was reading this study. See, the individuals, they began to take on each other's identity because they knew each other they spent time with each other they invested in each other they sacrificed for one another they loved one another see the more time that you spend with him the more you will begin to look like him in every aspect of our life The more time you spend with Him, you begin to sound like Him. You say the same things that He would say. You don't say the things that flesh says, but you say the things that Spirit says. See, the more time that you spend with Him, the more you begin to think like Him. You begin to think about the things that He thinks about. Just like I preached last Sunday, we begin to think about the people that he thinks about. Not just one group, but everybody. See, the more pain you experience, the more you begin to take on his characteristics. Pain doesn't automatically guarantee his characteristics. Because it 
matters how we handle it. How we endure it, as Paul said, endure as a good soldier. You know, when you begin to think about training, is there any previous military in here? Not right now. But when you begin to think about training that a soldier endures, and when you really get into special forces or operations, it's not just to the regular boot camp. It goes beyond that. There's endurance that has to be met. There's pain and there's, there's heartache that has to be endured because if you're going to achieve a level of greatness in that particular field, you're going to have to endure. Because if you can't endure it, you can't achieve it. Isaiah writes to us and says, But they were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance one would scarcely know he was a man. See, there's going to come a point in our life that the things that we have gone through will make us so unrecognizable to those around us. But the more unrecognizable you become, to those around you, the more you begin to look like Christ, the one that really matters. See, what you go through has the ability to propel you forward or to keep you from fulfilling the purpose that God has in you and for you. What you go through right now has the ability to move you forward Or move you backwards. It all matters how we respond. If you allow suffering. If you allow it. Suffering has the ability to transform you into the image God has called you to be. Somewhere in our church culture. Or our church ideology. We believe that when trouble happens. God is not involved in the process of the suffering. No God's not causing the suffering. As some may say, God doesn't cause suffering. But God is always involved in the suffering, meaning that God is walking with us and God is right there with us. No, God didn't cause it. God didn't bring it on because we live in a sinful world. We live in a world full of chaos. We live in a world that is already full of suffering. And so because we live in it, we are going to experience it. But let me tell you in the Holy Ghost right now, because of your suffering does not mean that God has walked away or God has left or God is not present, but God is more present than ever before. See, there's one thing that we have to understand about this suffering. Suffering is not a tool of destruction, but suffering has the ability to bring the fulfillment of the plan of God in our life. Suffering doesn't cause God to activate plan B. Rather, the suffering that we experience has the ability to get us to God's destination the fastest. We sometimes don't want to hear that. We are looking, God, how do I get to that destination the fastest? And he says there's two choices. You can go the long way or you can go the short way. Some of us just keep missing it all together. Because we would rather fight God instead of submit to God. We would rather fight against the pricks, as Paul says. We would rather fight these things instead of saying, God, help me to be a good soldier. God, help me to be faithful. God, I surrender everything to you. You know why we pray with our hands raised? Because it's an act of surrender. It's saying, God, I can't do it anymore. God, I can't make this anymore. God, I I can't walk this anymore. I, I just surrender to you now. You do what you do, God. See, suffering and loneliness are very similar. We go through seasons where it feels like everyone has left us. And we are all alone. When you begin to think about Elijah... Elijah is a great prophet of God. His story or his 
the writings of Elijah begin in 1 Kings 17. Elijah, the prophet, he prophesies to a wicked king, Ahab. And he says, it's not going to rain for three years, three and a half years, until I say it's going to rain. Now, it's pretty gutsy to prophesy to the king of Israel that it's not going to rain because of your wickedness. It says this in 17, two, verse, or 17 verses 2 through 4, Then the word of the Lord came unto him, Elijah, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward. Now, you've got to recognize the geography here. Ahab is in Samaria on the west side of the Jordan River. God tells Elijah, go eastward now to the other side of the Jordan River and hide by the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. It's a stream. It's a little brook. It's a runoff ditch. Something so small that runs into the Jordan River. God says it will be there that you will drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. See, when you begin to look at what the word cherith actually means, it means separation or hiding place. See, what God was doing was taking a man that God had anointed that was powerful. Scripture, it's interesting because even... Many times Elijah is compared to Melchizedek because there's no beginning of him. It just starts with him as a prophet. We don't see his upbringing, but we do see where he boldly prophesies to a wicked and perverse king that it's not going to rain. And automatically God says, okay, now I'm going to hide you. You were up here. Now I'm going to separate you to where nobody can ever see you. Where nobody can't find you. You're not going to be able to be seen or heard by anyone. See, it was a hiding place that God was preserving His man. God was preserving him in order that He would protect him from the king that was trying to destroy him. Elijah found himself in a place of loneliness away from everyone and everything. See, what's amazing about this whole story is when you begin to look at a map to where supposedly Elijah went by the brook of Cherith and where uh, Ahab's palace was, it really wasn't that far. But the scripture tells us when you go down to chapter 19, I believe, when, when Elijah is met with the servant of Ahab. And the servant says, Is this Elijah the prophet whom the king has searched everywhere for? He's looked everywhere for you and hasn't found you. But in all reality, he was right beside him. But God was saying, I'm going to preserve you and I'm going to protect you. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. But you've got to just trust me. You've got to keep your focus on me. So you've got to realize when God places you in those positions where flesh may rise up against you, you've got to be able to trust God and say, God, I don't understand this. I, I don't understand why it's happening this way, God. I, I, but I'm just going to trust you, God, because I know that you're working something out for my good he's got to trust that a little tributary is going to provide enough water for him to survive and then on top of that he's got to trust that a dirty bird is going to bring him food because to a Jew a raven is a dirty bird that they're supposed to stay away from They're a scavenger. They eat meat and whatever they can find. But God says, I'm going to send the very thing that you think is perverse, the thing that you think is dirty, and it's going to bring provision to you. See, there's times that loneliness is found in suffering. But see, 
If Elijah would have fought the process, if Elijah would have risen up and said, God, I, I'm not going to hide by this little river any longer because i I, I got to be out there. I'm missing people. I'm missing the conversation with people. When you jump to verse 8 through 16 of chapter 17, God tells Elijah to go to a city. And there's a lady there. The woman of Zarephath. God says, there's a lady there who's a widow, and she's got a son, and I want you to go to her. See, if he would have never listened to God and endured the suffering and the loneliness, he would have never met this widow woman who was about to die. And it was because Elijah went through the process God had designed for him. He prophesied the word of the Lord, and she and her son lived. There are two components of suffering that will either cause suffering to destroy us in the future or cause us to become the greatest the kingdom of God has ever seen. Number one, we can fight and respond in the flesh or we can understand that we are in the process of knowing Him. We can realize that what I am going through right now is not about me, but is it, it is about that He can truly be Lord of my life. See, what I'm going through right now, it's not about me, but it's all about Him. It's that He would be glorified in me and through me. See, what I'm walking through, what you're walking through right now, it's not about you. We've got to get that through our minds that it's not about us but it's that He would be magnified and glorified in us and through us. What I'm walking through right now can bring me to a place of complete restoration or it can take me to a place of complete brokenness and not brokenness of God. See, flesh always wants to respond though. Jesus stands before Pilate. Pilate says, are you not He? And the scripture says, but he answered him not a word. And the governor marveled greatly. Jesus is standing before the high priest and the elders and those of the religious system. And they begin to spit on him and smack him and begin to ridicule and accuse him. And he says not a word to them. He doesn't respond to accusations, but he endures. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, there was no deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, when he was persecuted, when he was ridiculed, when he was lied about, when he was accused of all of these different things, he did not fight back. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. See, when you keep your mouth closed and you choose not to respond to heartache and suffering, the Scripture tells us that we commit ourselves to Him who judges righteously. And He is the one that we are going to stand before one day, the righteous King and the Lord of Lords. And He's going to look at everything we've ever done on this earth and He's either going to say, I've judged you righteously because you've been righteous through everything that you have endured. See, through suffering, the plan of God was fulfilled. Suffering is meant to transform us into His glorious image. Suffering is the one thing that has the ability to transform us into the vessel that can be mightily used of God because it moves all flesh out of the way. Paul wrote to us and said in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, And the Lord who is a spirit makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. How do we as the church allow this spiritual transformation to, to, be, to be of being changed into His image? Paul told Timothy, I, 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 I've fought a good fight. I finished the race and I've kept the faith. 
See, we've got to understand this whole aspect of the power of His resurrection. And that power literally means the ability to perform supernatural things, supernatural power or authority, walking in the dimension of the Spirit, that our very words and actions can change the atmosphere. See, we have the power thing figured out. We preach about the power. We find ourselves in settings where spiritual impartations change us into walking into a spiritual dimension that we've never been before. We understand Acts 1 and 8, you shall receive power after that, that the Holy Ghost comes upon you. We preach about this power. We operate in this power and we pray in this power. And many times we find ourselves trying to power out of painful situations. We do our best to prophesy our way out of the pain that we are living. And after we are finished, we find ourselves in the same exact place. I feel very strongly this morning to prophesy into your spirit, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 7 through 9, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not in despair. We are persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. You've got to listen to the word that the Lord is trying to speak into your spirit this morning and realize what you're going through right now, what you've been through and what you may go through in the near future. It's all about Him that He can prove himself to be the one that is God over all things see there's also the aspect that Paul said there's also the fellowship of his suffering and let's be honest about suffering it's unjust it's not fair it's painful It's not kind. It crushes us. It breaks our heart. There are things that just don't make sense when it comes to suffering. Why, God? If you're such a loving God, why am I suffering? Come on, God, where are you? If we would be honest, many of us have probably asked that question probably not too long ago. God, where are you? I thought you were faithful, God. You don't seem to be too faithful right now, God. But there's a lot of times in life, go back to your days of school, and when you were taking the test, when you would try to raise your hand to ask the question, what did the teacher do? See, the teacher's quiet during the test. And there are times, no, I said it already, God didn't bring the suffering. The sinful world we live in brought the suffering. Just like Christ didn't bring the suffering on Him, it was from a sinful and perverse world that brought the suffering on Him. And we've got to realize this right here to this morning that if we are going to become and if we are going to overcome the now, then we've got to understand that God is on my side, that God's not forsaken me, that God has not walked away from me, that God has not left me, that God has not forgotten about me, that God's not looked over me because of maybe a mistake I made, but God is faithful to the end. See, suffering is the only way that we can truly become like Christ. See, our view of suffering means, our view of suffering many times sounds like this, I should not have to go through these types of things. See, we view suffering as something that the children of God should be exempt from. We think because we get the Holy Ghost that we are exempt from all of these things. But in reality, when we get the Holy Ghost... God brings us closer to be more like Him. And that means that there are times we will endure hardships. If we are truly a child of God, we are going to suffer. And if we are going to be made 
And if we're going to be anything of significance in the kingdom of God, suffering is a prerequisite for His anointing. There, are, there is no anointing without painful, excruciating discomfort of suffering. Not only are there seasons of suffering as individuals, but there are also seasons of suffering as the bride. But we've got to understand this. Suffering... It's not meant to destroy. It's not meant to break. But it is meant to produce something. Suffering can produce many things. One, it ensures that all flesh is dead. It causes us to understand mercy. See, any time you suffer from the hands of individuals, you can either hate mercy or love mercy. It causes us to ensure that the fruit becomes our filter. See, when you suffer, yeah, you can fight back. You can raise your fist. You can say things... You can do whatever you want to do. God will let you. But if we allow suffering, it'll produce something. It'll make something to where the fruit is our filter. That everything that comes out of our mouth is covered by the fruit of the Spirit. That everything that comes out of our mouth is covered by by love. It's covered by mercy. It's covered by peace. It's covered by long suffering. It's covered by gentleness. See, that's the one thing that we have to have in this hour is we've got to ensure that the fruit is our filter. Everything that comes out of our mouth has to be covered by the fruit of the Spirit. Paul writes toward the end of his life in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, and, and he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. And reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am truly strong. See, when you begin to look throughout the Bible, and I'm almost done because we're almost at time. There's individuals that they had the choice to respond negatively to suffering. Or they could endure suffering as a good soldier. And God elevated them. And God brought them to a place where they were called faithful. Job. Job lost everything. But at the end, Job was righteous. Did he have his moments? Yeah. Because even God said, can I talk now? Sit down and pull your britches up. And let me have something to say to you. Joseph, Joseph, ah, he didn't get it right all the time. But Joseph was mocked, thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, elevated to be a chief servant, thrown in prison again, lied about, and then elevated once again to be a chief inmate. And finally, in one instance, pulled out, shaved, given a fresh pair of clothes and a ring on his finger, never again to be put in prison, but to be second in command of all of Egypt. See, there's times that we have a twisted view of suffering and we feel that we've done something wrong to experience suffering. It's not that we have 
done something wrong. It's rather that God's glory can be made manifest in us and through us. Because it's all about His glory. It's all about Him. It's all about that He would be visible to a dark world. See, some of you even right now are in a prison cell of suffering. Cursing the moment, cursing what is happening, and refusing to allow the power of God to operate in your season in order to elevate you to His purpose. When you begin to think about suffering, it's not something we want to think about. But Paul said, I've got to know him. I've got to know him. I've got to understand him. I've, I've got to see him. I've got to perceive him. I, I've got to really understand every aspect of who he really is. See, that's what God is trying to do in this hour to His church is that the church would really see Him for who He really is. Because when the church can see Him for who He really is, then the church can operate in its designed purpose. Stand with me this morning. I just want us to do something before we transition. I want us just to reach over if it's appropriate. And I want us to pray strength into our brother or our sister right now. Let's do that. Just reach over. And I just want you to pray strength into their mind, into their spirit right now. God, I pray this morning, God, that you would strengthen your people, God. God, that your strength would be made perfect in and through, Lord Jesus. God, I pray right now, Lord God, that you would strengthen every person, every mind, every heart, every spirit right now, God. And God, Your glory would be made manifest in us and through us right now. God, we give You glory, we give You honor, we give You praise right now, Lord Jesus. We thank You for what You're going to do right now in this next service, God. We thank You for what You're going to do in us and through us, Lord God. And God, I pray right now that You would help us to see You in all things and understand what You're doing through us and in us. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Greet someone. Go tell someone hi that you've never met before. Tell them you're glad they're here this morning and get ready for what God's going to do. Build each other's faith up. Speak things in the faith. Amen.